why are we often our own worst enemies? Like we expend enormous amounts of energy resisting what is here right now. Like you can't change what's here right now, but boy, do we try hard. Where does courage come from? Courage is really an unwiring of the belief that you'll die if you feel pain. Can strangers really channel the spirit of our lost relatives? She was walking around and saying, I F who I want, I own who I want, I'm the king. She didn't know she was being a man. This week, Rosen practitioner and family constellations therapist, Kata Wittich, on Nine Questions with Eric Oliver. Good morning, Dre. Hi, how are you? Hi, good morning, Eric. So tell me about Kata Wittich. Okay, Kata Wittich is one of the most interesting people I've ever met. As a little bit of background, she was born in the 1950s in New York to a family of bohemian intellectuals. Um, she went to Yale for college and then got a degree in film at NYU. And then she moved to LA and worked in the movie business for several decades. But Kato suffered from a lot of chronic pain and I think even mercury poisoning. And it started affecting her work. And she was looking for help when she came upon the Rosen method. This is a type of therapy that uses talk and touch to generate healing. And for Kato, it works so well that she decided to get trained as a Rosen practitioner and she started working as a Rosen practitioner. And several years later, she encountered a new kind of therapy called family constellations therapy. This is a type of therapy where groups of people get together and they channel the energy and spirit of prior generations as a way of healing past traumas. Kato describes this in the unedited version of our podcast. So if you're interested, you can listen to that. And you can also see her on an episode of Sex, Love, and Goop on Netflix, which actually filmed an example of family constellations therapy. Kato has a lot of really deep and profound answers to the nine questions on how to know yourself. And I felt really touched by my conversation with her, and I'm excited to share it here. What you're about to hear is the edited version of Eric's conversation with Kato. To hear more about Kato, the Rosen Method, and Family Constellations Therapy, go to 9-questions.com, where you can find a link to our Patreon page. We are happy to give Patreon supporters access to the full versions of our podcasts, which you can be for less than a dollar a month. Hi, Kato. Hi, Eric. What are you? I really don't know. I know that I um, am embodied, and I know that I think. I know that I perceive in ways that are not just thinking, and I don't fully understand those. And I don't know whether my this flesh, whatever this matter or this mostly not matter <laughs> matter is, mm-hmm. that is me, um, I don't know whether that's the whole of me is encompassed in this or whether there's some kato that exists outside because of my experiences in the work I do with both Rosen Method and Family Constellations, I have a lot of direct experience of n- not being as separate from other humans as we traditionally feel in Western culture. So I have a lot of direct experience of perceiving larger boundaries in a way than just my body. Beyond that, I don't have any idea if there's such thing as a soul or any kind of self that might even exist right now, but might might go after death, might continue. I kind of doubt it because my tendency is to think that anything that's too comfortable for our minds to comprehend is probably something we're making up. <laughs> something that's not a very scientific thought, but that yeah, is, no, no. you know, yeah, it's, it's a safe one. <laughs> you know, I I just have a little doubt when it's too easily comprehensible. I don't know why if 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 we still continue to exist as energy, which we that we clearly do, but whether there's any me there or any, you know, whether there's just a dispersion of the energy, I don't know. But if we do, it would be really surprising to me if, if it was something that would be recognizable to us. You said something that struck me, and I, I wanted to ask you a little more about it. When you said perceiving without thinking... So in its most fundamental, there are, there are bodily perceptions that, that I have, partly because of the training, the long years of training to pay attention to my body and other people's bodies and the ways that our feelings are, are expressed by our bodies, contained by our bodies. 
Um, Marian Rosen, who was my teacher, once had a wonderful thing. Somebody asked her, you know, what do you do with your client when they first come in the room before you, you know, before you work with them? And she said, oh, I feel them. And the person said, well, well how do you feel them? Oh, I feel them with my back. And it was kind of <laughs> like, so there is something behind my heart that expands sometimes when I have perceptions of what's happening in another. Like you right now felt touched for a moment by that when, mm -hmm. I, when I said that. So I just felt you expand a bit, and then I felt me expand a bit. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like that. Right. And I don't know what always what it means. I might even put a wrong interpretation on it. Uh -huh. But I've come to trust it as a way of being. So it's a way of encountering the world and particularly other people that is organized prior to thought yeah and i think it's often the preface like it, then there's conscious thought that comes in that interprets but it is kind of i mean from from the studies that i've read perception actually happens in your heart first have you ever do you know about heart math no oh so heart math has 30 years of really interesting, I think, at least 30 years of study, lots and lots of um, attempts to quantify and see what happens in the body when, when people are in different states and things. And then they have a meditation practice and they have a device that measures your heart rate variability. So it tells you in real time what state you're in, if you're in a sympathetic arousal, if you're in, and they have it. You know, there are now lots of things on the market, but they are the very first ones to do, and I trust their science very much. Mm -hmm. And one of the studies, or several of the studies they did, just show that your heart responds to stimuli before your brain does. So, like, we all kind of think stuff comes in through our thinking, but it right. actually right. comes physiologically in you already are having a reaction before your brain even processes that reaction. Sure. I think there's a science about this called the vagus nerve. Is the I'm vagus nerve. Vagus nerve, that's mm -hmm. it. I never know how to pronounce that because I just read it. <laughs> it doesn't come up in conversation most important, very much. Most important part of our body other than fascia and most important part of our nervous system in many ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What is your purpose? I don't know if we have a purpose. Uh -huh. Certainly as a we, you know. So if that question is like, what is my purpose specific to me? Mm -hmm. So I would say my purpose is to be happy and in my experience, and then there's also lots of science to back this, joy mostly comes from being fully present in, in this moment mm -hmm. and from any, any uh, practice that is easing suffering in both ourselves and in others. So giving you know, finding how you bring ease. So my, my purpose is to bring ease and joy for me and anybody else that I can. The, if I do these things from a place of effort, rather than bring, having my attention also be on me and on how it feels in me, then they're not very successful. Then I bring more effort into the world. Funny to me because <clears throat> when I ask this question to people, I think a lot of people feel bad about saying my purpose is to be happy because that sounds too selfish and narcissistic. And of course, I, my purpose must be to help others. But inevitably, if you, if you dig into it, the reason when you want to help others is because you're not happy when you see other people you know, who are in distress. Exactly. It, it does really come back to that. And, um, and I, I, to me, it's, it's refreshing because you spend your professional life helping others <laughs> and um but you recognize that it's really about your own state um or else this. i have a story about that that's a painful story but uh -huh. really important to me um i lost a really beloved sister when she was 45 to cancer and mm -hmm. i was i've been the companion the death companion for a number of people mm -hmm. And in her dying process, what I learned was I was so present for her. I mean, I really, I'm a bit her mother. You know, I took care of her. I was, and my our other sister helped, but she's the younger sister. So I'm the holder of space and the doer of all the doctor stuff and all these things. And my sister was really grateful to me, but I could feel where she didn't quite trust me. Mm -hmm. And there was always this sort of little bit of pulling back, and I didn't know what it was. And in the last um, 
two days of her life when she was in the hospital in hospice and dying. There was a moment where I just realized that I had been needing for there to be something okay in there. I had been needing for some part of her journey to be okay. It's not okay dying of ovarian cancer horribly at 45 when you want to live. And and in my need to fix so that I could feel okay, mm-hmm. she couldn't trust me because there wasn't room for her experience totally. Yeah. And what that meant was I wasn't fully dealing with my own reaching for my own happiness, my own okayness. I was too enmeshed with her. I had too much feeling that if I didn't fix her suffering, I would would be suffering. Yeah. I wasn't willing to be happy while she suffered. And when that shift happened where I could be willing to survive her, mm-hmm. to be happy, to mourn terribly, but to not have to... Um, have anything be okay in order for me to be happy yeah all of a sudden this it just felt like with her like all the distrust dissolved i held her in my arms as she died there was no more need for her to 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 help take care of me by something being okay And, and do you think that that was fear too there was like there's behind that is this fear because I, I, I feel this some in my complicated relationships with, with my parents and when my dad died and this feeling like, oh, there are these unresolved issues. And there was a fear when I was with him as he was dying that initially that if I don't resolve these issues, they're going to haunt me the rest of my life. And, you know, and this is my only opportunity. But when I was actually with him when he was dying, that did kind of go away. And it was just this moment of we are together here. And I don't feel haunted by any issues now. Um, and that in itself was was the gift of that experience uh, for me, was that, oh, I thought there was these issues, and it turns out they really weren't, they weren't that important, and I was, they, I, I had inflated them because I was so afraid of them to what they really, really were. And that's the whole resistance thing I'm talking about. So yeah. that's the gift that a dying, a close dying process often gives us, is it's so intense that it shifts you away from the resistance into just the, here we are, two people together who love each other and one is exiting. Who are you really? I'm a being who loves a lot. And I think that that's really true. I have a, a huge... Uh, a fundamental desire for well-being for all beings. I'm not very competitive. I'm not, but you know, I'm not mushy. But I'm not, you know, very competitive. It makes me really happy when others are happy. But at the same time, I'm a being whose survival was dependent on taking care of her mother and making sure her mother was okay. So I always have to pay attention to where I'm needing for everybody to be okay, as opposed to owning my own happiness. Uh There's so much joy that comes in stepping out of fighting um, or fixing what is, stepping out of fighting realities that hurt. There's so much joy that comes when we don't need to shut away any feelings and we share with another human in 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 the rawest of forms where we're not fixed when you say about being with someone and not fixing them it brings to mind this lesson i er i learned early in my marriage when theo would come and talk to me and she would start talking about something that was bothering her and my initial input was to fix it because I don't know if it's a male thing. But it but, is. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> you guys are wired for it. You don't yeah. have a choice. Your brains right. are set up for it. Your hormones are right. set up for it. Right. And I would just say, oh, well, why don't you just do this, this, and this, and that will solve it. And then just frustration and anger. And then I, I slowly learned just to stop and just to listen and just to say, yes, I understand. And that pivot did wonders, <laughs> but it really, it required a lot of effort because my inclination is to fix. Yeah. yeah. And and some of that is so evolutionary. I mean, men, you know, the, the, we, we have different evolutionary purposes, I suppose you could say, and, and that take charge, 
get rid of the threat thing yeah, <laughs> is, yeah. is what you guys are supposed to do. And then as far as I can tell, my poor husband does the same thing and then feels absolutely, you know, like a failure when I'm looking at him going, could you just shut up and yeah. listen to me for a second? All I want is to be heard. Yeah. But I think as humans, we mostly need to be witnessed. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think when somebody tries to fix, it doesn't leave room for us. What are your dreams telling you? I think my dreams are inviting me to notice that there's a way to diminish the stress or the impact of the stress without saying no to everything, which would be if I move out of my childhood survival strategies that I have to get it right. It has to be perfect. Everybody has to feel better because of it, Mm -hmm. It, as opposed to just, it has to feel good to me when I do it. And if other people don't like it, that's fine. And if it lands for one person, that's fine. My life doesn't end. So I think the only way I get to go forward in life now in a juicy, rich way, the way I want is actually my dreams are trying to tell me you have to not expect yourself to be always in control of things that you can't possibly be in control of. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's great. What moves you? So I think the, the biggest thing that moves me is just our courage and our kindness to each other. Um, how do you find courage? Our sense of safety is deeply connected to whether we feel safe being inside of our bodies and our mind hearts ourself, you know. So courage is really an unwiring of the belief that you'll die if you feel pain. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. And, it, and any way you can support going toward the pain, when you do go toward the pain, you find out it doesn't kill you. So in a Rosen session, often people will, will weep and weep and weep, and they won't even know why they're weeping. And it doesn't matter why they're weeping. It matters that it had to be held in all those years, and now there's space for it. And then they find out they don't die. And sometimes if somebody's had a really traumatic life, they'll feel only the smallest amount, but that small amount changes everything because it wasn't allowed. Like it couldn't be felt. It was too yeah. scary. So there, and then there are multiple ways you can resource yourself. I mean, even some of the microdosing that people are doing is an interesting thing because it immediately helps with with brain wiring and making whatever it is called BDN, whatever the stuff that helps your neurons, you know, sort of refresh themselves and yeah. change. Um, there, more and more we're recognizing as a society that, that this living, hiding from pain doesn't function. And so courage comes really from being supported. It's not something you just shove yourself into. And one of the most important parts is just to know the part of you that had to shut away from the pain, that couldn't handle it because you were too young and you didn't have um the resources, if you push that part, if you don't listen to that part, if you demand that that part grow up and get better now, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> won't happen. Yeah. So it's all about sort of tenderness and kindness to yourself, to that part that had to shut things down. You know, whatever the survival mechanisms we had, like to honor those survival mechanisms and know they probably no longer apply. Yeah. Who's writing your life story? My survival mechanism. <laughs> I loved that question. I thought about it a bit. Because <laughs> at first I wanted to say, oh, I'm a very self-aware person. I live a very examined life, so I'm writing my life story. And I thought, yeah. what nonsense, Kato. Yeah. All of our survi- for all of us, our survival strategies write our life story. We don't get to choose from our thinking place un- unless... We slow down enough, we pause, we find the ways to notice that we're, that we're having a reaction. But even then, we, have, we, are, we don't get to choose our feelings. One of the things you really see in, in, in a Rosen Method practice is you can't have joy if you won't let yourself have pain. You mm-hmm. can't have a full spectrum of, of feelings because when you shut down feeling, you don't get to shut down just the feeling you don't like. You have to, across the board, shut down feelings. And for many of us, our traumas 
uh, in our families of origin happen so early that we just learn that feeling is dangerous. Knowing yourself at all is dangerous because if you know yourself, you might not do what your family of origin needs you to do. You might be too loud, you might be too weak, you might be too needy, you might need your mom to pick you up when she just can't bear it for a second, you know. And these are not, you don't have to have big abuse. We learn very early how to not know what we want, how to not feel ourselves, how to try to manipulate the situation but not actually be fully in ourselves. So if we ignore that child that had to li live that way or if we demand it be grown up all of a sudden and like make this jump nothing happens it's mm -hmm. about going toward it and feeling with that part of you the things that are really scary and then it stops feeling so dangerous now you probably won't die if you're too big <laughs> yes yes some people might get mad at you though <laughs> <laughs> well you know the the thing that I like about your characterization of understanding this family legacy that we we carry, and that's really what this question is yes. about. And a lot of us end up in a place of um, either feeling victimized or resentful. And the characterization of this was your parents' survival strategy, and they are inheriting their parents' survival strategy, and these survival strategies go all the way back, is a very generous way, and it's a very forgiving way of, of encountering your family legacy. Yes. And it's not even forgiving, because I always have a problem with forgiving, because yeah. that, that kind of assumes there's somebody who's on some pedestal who can forgive, and then you're so big you're forgiving. It's actually just the truth. We, yeah. we, every wounded person, even like unnameable people that I would never name, didn't, didn't get to destroy a country because they, <laughs> because they chose to be the way they are. They, they, you know, every, every autocrat ever has something lacking deeply inside of them that came from wounds in their family. So when we feel victimized or when we demonize the ancestors or the family, pattern we just we're just stuck in 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 a constant feedback loop of interacting with them we're not free of them yeah so what i'm perceiving and what i liked really from that question was my survival strategies write the story but i rewrite it now if you if you rewrite over and over again if you if you notice how you're talking to yourself and if you notice how your story is written by your need for survival in something that doesn't happen anymore isn't true anymore mm -hmm. you do start to change your language you do start to change how you experience things and how reactive you are so you are changing the story but you don't get to change it in the moment it's kind of like that think fast think slow thing or yeah. you know pema children and the pause you yeah. know it's yeah. that only in the pause is the juice Do you own your shit or does your shit own you? So what does that mean to you, that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's funny because when I was fr phrasing these questions and I showed them to my father-in-law, and he's a very conservative, culturally conservative, like traditional kind of person, and he was like, that's a vulgar term. You know, you should just say your possessions. And I, I'm like, but it's not about possessions. <laughs> it's really about the parts of ourselves that we don't like that that make us uncomfortable yeah. that we want to expel yeah. and that, so how do we yeah. how do we coexist with it are we are we defined and dominated by these parts of ourselves um and maybe own is the wrong maybe it's that's totally the wrong that's word maybe the maybe the problem's not the shit it's the own yeah, yeah, Eric. <laughs> it's the own yeah it's the own and 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 so to, my answer would be neither. Mm -hmm. um, m my answer would be I'm making friends with my own shit, which is my survival strategies that no longer work. And they are powerful and useful. So I'm finding their beauty now instead uh -huh. of trying to get rid of them. Nothing works when you're trying to get rid of things. It's a, it's a resistance. It's always going toward it rather than pushing things away. I think that's that's part of the problem with a lot of our shit. It rewarded us at one point in time, and so we think it's the viable strategy, but we don't see that it's it's outdated. 
that yeah. it's ex- that's right. the whole picture is yeah. we don't see that it's outdated and it's limiting but in order to undo it we can't talk ourselves out of it with our brains as far as i can tell it just doesn't work you get you get somewhere mm-hmm. but it's not where the reaction is the reaction is way under your conscious thinking yeah. so what you in my experience what you have to do is you have to go toward whatever you were trying to get rid of with that survival pattern and then that strong survival part can become what it really can be. So an example in me would be, it was necessary to take care of others first in my family of origin for me to survive, for my mom to survive, you know? And that was for me, right? Mm -hmm. When I finally went toward what it was like to have been loved so much and not, and at the same time, never be adequate because I couldn't be my mom's mother. Mm-hmm. Like that howling grief that you're trying so hard to make safety and it just can't exist because you don't, it's not possible. I could not take my mother's pain away, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I felt the pain of not being able to take her pain away, and then even deeper, my pain of, of never getting to rest on on in safety there being my father was a survivor of of the war his town was firebombed in my house there was no sense of underlying knowledge of safety in either of my parents when i started to let myself feel how unsafe the world felt and let myself feel how much pain there was in not having ever been held parented in a way that brought safety Mm -hmm. i stopped needing to fix everybody yeah it's not about them or about a decision it's actually just a really deep emotional shift that i'm okay being in pain now well and that's um something that's come up in other conversations and from my own experience too it's when we have these moments of grief one of the upsides of grief, if you encounter grief healthily, is that grief strips everything away. And and then you are face to face with what you fear most or what is most painful. And there's no place to run. And this is this is Pema Chodron's idea too, where you're just nailed. And but it's then using that in a productive way and using that space in a productive way to go forward. Right. Yeah. And if you're supported enough, so when you're not supported, I mean, trauma is un, when, you, when you're not supported in the grief or the stress, so it's too much and you go on overload and you have to shut down. Yeah. So when you re-experience those things, not deliberately, they have to be coming on their own. They, it has to be a choice for the body to let it up because otherwise it's not safe. And the body has tremendous wisdom about what it will let up or what it won't let up. But when it comes up in a safely held environment, then it just shifts on its own. You don't have to do something about it. Okay, we, we, we have <laughs> two, more? two questions, okay. one of which I think you've already really answered, which is, how do you find love? Ah. So I'm really blessed that I, you know, that I have an enormous amount of love in my life, but I, I also am really aware I still need to learn how to let it in more. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I loved, my teacher, Marian Rosen, um, who was a very honest human, would say that she didn't know how, she was surrounded by love, but she couldn't feel loved until she was over 70, which has always gives... A <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's hope for that, yeah. So it's actually quite important, yeah. and this is a person who changed so many lives, and yet even while she was changing lives, she could never really feel loved. and. And so we are often barricaded from feeling loved. So I feel like I, you know, I've been married, I've been with my husband for 36 years. I love him intensely. Uh, I feel very loved by him. And I have places where I don't love myself enough, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I shut down. So Mm -hmm. I think my practice now is all this other stuff that we talked about, that if I can find this being in the present moment sense of safety as opposed to trying to fix things um that i think i'm going to get to have deeper experiences of loving and being loved i think i'm actually pretty good at loving it's the feeling the the taking in of love that i'm not always it's easily unseated in me okay I have I have a lot of questions about that, but we're under time. So um, 
um, I think we'll we'll stay with no, that. No, so go ahead and ask one if you if you want. Well, to it, it goes back to that that question of then how do you let love in? Yeah. 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 And I think so, a lot of a lot of us struggle with that. Yes. So it's the same thing. You go toward pain. Mm-hmm. You go toward wherever you have to shut yourself down because you can't feel loved or joy when you have to contain yourself to protect yourself from bad feelings. It, it's, it, it, and actually there's new neurobiology that's really interesting, like around the dopamine and things like that and the way that we try to balance out our brains. I mean, you really have to have not just all the time joy. You have to have pain. You have to allow the, the things that hurt. Mm-hmm. Or else you get out of whack, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's the same thing for everything. It's to make friends with where you hurt, to find the ways you can support yourself, and, the, and to find external, because it's really hard to do on your own. I mean, even if all you're doing is doing it in a friend group, it makes a difference. And I think there are plenty of ways to do that. Because we were, you know, evolution was endlessly communal life where we're supported just by the resonance of feeling another body with a person who's present you know and we we don't have that enough Mm -hmm. you know so i think that the things that shut down love in me are probably many of the same things that shut down love in you and mostly they have to do with lack of self-love and 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 self-judgment which is a really good survival strategy when you're little and your family of origin is unsafe. Yeah. Like all that self-judgment keeps you really safe. It keeps you on your toes. It does all these great things. And now imagine if that strong, strong voice that's always ready to bash you was on your side. Beyond the dentist, where are you going next? <laughs> no, no, it's just a tooth cleaning, thank God. Um, so I think this is already, like, we really chewed on a lot of it. I have a very concrete thing that is, that is really difficult for me, which is that my life has kind of exploded in the last chunk of time with this Netflix documentary showing my work and lots and lots of people who want family constellations and Rosen, and I would love to do it for every single person who wants it. Mm-hmm. And right before uh, the Goop Labs folks keep kept started asking me to do the, the, the episode on family constellations, which I tried not to do repeatedly, mm-hmm. I had just settled in to finally write a, a 12-episode television series that I've been working on for years and years and years that I've been researching for 25 years that I have like an entire sort of adoptive family that I really, really love. And the project is about the moment in, in, in America where their ancestors, who were the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts, um, were part of this moment in America where Reconstruction failed and where we turned towards where we are politically now and, and towards all the, the difficulties that we live with by ignoring the wounding in our country. And so I have an enormous need. I have characters that want to speak through me. I have mm-hmm. so much passion for this project. And to do it, I have to say no to a whole lot of other things. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So I feel like where I go now is learning, if I can, how to not have to say a flat no to everything. I mean, I've had to say no to individual stuff, but like, if I move toward that self-love that says you don't have to get things perfectly, not everybody has to like what you're doing or think well of you, even if you screw something up and you don't get it right, the world will not end, you will not die. But if you work this hard at everything, you have to stop doing everything but writing. Mm -hmm. And that will hurt so much. Yeah. Um, But the one thing I've never done in my life is given myself the chance to just go completely into that cocoon that you do when you're really writing, when you're fully, you know, it just comes through me. Writing is, is easy and joyful when I'm doing it, but the world and all the needs of everybody else always gets in the way. So that's my... My next step is to see how much can I change my internal relationship to how I do things so that I can keep some richness of this one, this side of things that I have very strongly explored and let myself do the other thing that I'm kind of coming back to that I left for a long chunk of time. 
Well, that strikes me also a wonderful position to be in. (laughs) It's better to be saying no to the many things that are compelling in your life than trying to figure out what is compelling in my life, which, um, so that's a blessing. Oh, I consider myself, I consider myself unbelievably lucky on so many levels. I mean, just, I have so, there are so many things I love, people I love, experiences I have that are so rich, you know, I just... The one thing I never can quite connect to is is when people are bored because I've just, it's unimaginable to me and has never been there. But I know what that's like because my husband often can be bored and I watch what it is, is it's a shutting down to, to the, it's a not being allowed to want and need and have strong feelings. Mm-hmm. It's a survival strategy. Yeah. You know, so I'm never bored (laughs) that one's not my survival strategy (laughs) um well thank you so much for coming and taking the time and um sharing your wisdom which is profound so eric what was your takeaway from your conversation with kata my conversation with kata really got me to rethink my understanding of pain Mm mm-hmm when I would normally think of pain, I think of pain as something to be avoided. Um, like if I feel bad or I feel pain, I want to make myself feel better right away. Like pain sucks. Mm-hmm. What I learned from Kato is that pain is there to give us information. It's there to tell us something. When we're in pain, it's our body's way of signaling to us that something is amiss, that something needs our attention. And rather than running away from pain, we need to listen to our pain. We need to observe our pain. And that's hard for us because our normal habit is to quell our pain, flee from our pain, take aspirin, do whatever we can to distract ourselves from pain or make pain go away. Yeah. And I think the challenge to really knowing yourself and living better ultimately means observing, listening, and learning from whatever pain signals you're getting. Because this is your body telling you that something's not right. The second thing I take away from Kata was how important it is to be open to other people. No self is an island. And our ability to stay balanced, our ability to optimize ourselves, really exists in direct proportion to our ability to be open to others. And the more that we can let others touch us and connect with us and see us, the more balanced, the better functioning, and the more peaceful we're going to live. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe to hear more wisdom from interesting and insightful guests in the weeks ahead. If you feel like you're getting a lot out of our show, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show you should check out. It's called Capitalisn't. Capitalisn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways capitalism is, and more often isn't, working today. From the debate over how to distribute a vaccine to the morality of a wealth tax, capitalism clearly explains how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capitalism, part of the award-winning University of Chicago Podcast Network.